lately we've been crashing unconventional markets for honey. We've been going to craft shows, gun shows, anywhere we can get. Oh, that's cool. And you would be amazed at uh, the sales that we have. Hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is Carson. I have with me here Nick Kaminsky. That's right. All right. With Hickory Tree Farm Apiaries. Apiaries. I'm having a little trouble pronouncing that, but that's okay. So, uh, if you this is your first time uh, listening, uh, what on the HW podcast, what we do is we get the stories of entrepreneurs and they talk about their journey of starting their businesses and uh, pursuing the different paths that they have in life. And so, Nick, if you don't know what an apiary is, like I didn't um, a few days ago, then <laughs> it's, a, it's a bee farm. So, Nick, um, we're going to go through things. We're going to talk about your backstory. Then we're going to talk about uh, when you became interested in the business that you're in. And uh, talk about learning points along the way and then some things for your guys' future. And then we'll end with like, you know, any advice that you would have for any other up and coming beekeepers. So you ready to get started? Sure. Let's kick it off. All right. Let's do this. So first off, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, about your background, you know, maybe where you grew up, those sort of things. Right on. Yeah. See, I, I grew up here in Michigan, um, in Kent City. I went to high school here, had a pretty normal childhood. And um, when I was kind of young and early on in my high school career, I decided that I wanted to join the military. And the most difficult one, I was told, was the Marines. So why I decided to choose that based off of difficulty, a lot of people do. Uh, so I took it. That- they get a lot of guys with that. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Uh, it's a popular selling point. Um, <laughs> there's been tons of times I've been told by other ser- service members, hey, uh, I was going to join the Marines, but <laughs> so that's uh, that's that's just a, a fact of life, though. I, I got nothing but love for my uh, other uh, brothers and sisters in the uh, armed forces and the other branches. But I decided on Marines for myself. <clears throat> and. I went to uh, boot camp right out of high school. I ended up becoming an artilleryman and served um, in various different regiments. I was in 11th Marines and I was in 12th Marines. I was an instructor at Edson Range for boot camp and I was an instructor at the Marine Corps uh, Cannon um, Schoolhouse there in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And uh, after a while, I decided that uh, I was going to go ahead and make my transition out of the Marine Corps and come back to civilian life to spend more time with my family. Cool. Cool story. What did you get out as? I got out as a staff sergeant. Staff sergeant? Yep. Okay. So you you had a little bit of leadership training, some organizational experience by the time you left. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't say that I had everything figured out, but I had some pretty good pointers on how I should conduct myself as an individual or maybe even as a business owner and based off of the leadership experiences that I had when I was a Marine. You know, that's something that I tell guys. I remember when I got out, um, I got out as a squad leader and I was keeping in touch with some of my junior guys and I, I wrote a little thing on social media and I, I posted a little, uh, some advice. I said, uh, I recommend that you do at least, you stay in to get at least one deployment in a leadership billet because the experience that you have deploying and being in charge of others carries with it tremendous value uh, into your future. Um, so I think, and I think there is a point to be made there. I think that, uh, you know, so you got, how? when did you deploy? Um, I deployed in the earlier portion of Operation Iraqi Freedom with the 15th Mu. And then around the 2006, I think, time frame, I went to Ramadi, Iraq, 
And then after that, uh, I believe it was, yeah, 2011 was when I was in Afghanistan at Firebase Fiddler's Green. So those are the the three combat deployments I had. I did have a abbreviated UDP to Japan. I, I left that early to attend training elsewhere. You were deployed during some pretty pivotal points in time. Yeah, it was definitely a kick in time to be in the Marine Corps and uh, to be operating in those different theaters. And um, I mean, dude, you were in... These early years of the Iraq, were you in the push? I was not in the push. I was okay, right okay. after the push. But uh, you went to Ramadi. Yeah, Ramadi. I was in Ramadi when things were pretty nasty. And then you went to Marja. Yeah, the Marja role was a little bit more subdued for me because I served a purely artillery role in uh, in the Marja campaign at Firebase Feathers Green. I never left the, uh, the firebase, which was very small. Mm-hmm. So that was, I definitely know what the term Stockholm syndrome means. <laughs> I was kind of not ready to leave that place after about eight months. I was very used to those dirt berms, but that was a very high intense, uh, high intensity area also because we had uh, Marines and soldiers out there that were getting in trouble on a daily basis. And my job was to stare at that screen and wait for somebody to pick a fight that they needed help in and provide them with whatever fire support assets that I could to ensure their safety and take out the enemy. So that was definitely a stressful environment too. Yeah. No pressure. No, not at all. Yeah. Um, so how long were you in for? I was in for 11 years and seven months. I came in in August, 2003 and got out in April, 2014. What made you decide to get out after 11 years? You passed the halfway mark for retirement. Well, you know, that is a great question. And it's a question that I get a lot. Um, A lot of people are kind of say, well, you know, you could have had it on easy street. All you had to do was wait and uh, do eight more years. Easy street, Street. quote unquote. But uh, the fact of the matter is, well... um, the Veterans Administration and and uh, our retirement plans are getting a lot better for the military. Uh, but we're getting better at taking care of our veterans. We still have a lot of ways to go. And the pension after 20 years of service, uh, let's say for maybe someone in E7, this is going to be the greatest. You know, you're going to have to have some sort of supplemental income. And in addition to that, it's just like you mentioned earlier when you said stay in for you know, a period of time when you can do a combat deployment or any sort of deployment where you can have a leadership position. At that point in time, I had completed a few combat deployments, not as many as some, but more than a few. And in addition to that, one of those deployments was as an artillery operations chief, which was the job that I signed up to do. Mm-hmm. So at that point in time, I had felt very fulfilled in my career, I had completed uh, quite a successful tour as an instructor back at the schoolhouse. So having been quite fulfilled with my career and how it was going and what I had accomplished, I felt like I was ready to spend some more time with my family, uh, be able to guarantee my ability to be around for them, and to start approaching that next chapter. Mm. Were you married? Yeah, I was married uh, pretty early on in my career. About halfway through my first enlistment was when I met my wife. Um, We met and instantly started dating. And uh, about three months after that was when I left on my first deployment to Iraq. So that was definitely... um, Wow. Yeah, that's a relationship killer right there. Yeah. So needless to say that, you know, when you come back after... After all that, after a stressful time, and that Ramadi deployment uh, was doing convoy escorts during that time in a gun truck, it was not uh, an easy task to say, okay, we're just going to go out there. It's it's not driving to the grocery store. Every piece of trash, every pothole, every culvert, every car stopped on the side of the road, anything and everything is a possible perceived threat. So that's a stressful time to be involved with somebody in a long distance relationship. (laughs) Uh, yeah. So certainly, man, that's so when your decision to get out, was a decision both of you had made. So, but there's some more to that too. Did you have kids by then? No? Uh, we had one child by then. Uh, oh. We had my my oldest son. He was actually born when I was on my Afghanistan deployment. That was probably one of the biggest things that I wouldn't say pushed me to make my exit from the Marine Corps. Um, 
it was just a one of many factors. But my son was three months old when I had gotten back from Afghanistan. So I wasn't there when he was born or anything. And not only there was a little bit of uh, the feeling of missing out a little bit on that, but in addition to that, it was a very stressful time for my wife. You know, she's in, we were stationed at that time in Hawaii. So she's in Hawaii by herself, um, having to give birth without uh, a lot of support. Uh, and that was just a very difficult time for her. So mm. I didn't want to have to have her potentially go through that again. Yeah. Yeah. Cause when a serviceman serves or a service woman serves, it's also their family that also makes a sacrifice, right? Your family has to stay home and worry about you and do life without you. It, you know, so there's a lot of that to play. So did you guys have a plan when you decided to get out? Did you know that you were going to start a a bee farm? Um, when I first got out, we didn't really have, I wouldn't say the solidest of plans. We had an idea of what we wanted to do. Mm. Uh, when we moved up here, we, you know, had watched all the, the YouTube videos and saw the Facebook pages and this and that. And that stuff was starting to get real popular about people who were having kind of like the homesteader lifestyle, the hobby farm thing. And we thought that that was something that we would enjoy. And that was what we wanted to do. We wanted to have a farm with beef cattle and stuff like that. And uh, I would work some sort of a regular job. And that was that was loosely kind of our plan. At no point in time did we envision starting an apiary and becoming commercial beekeepers. So at what point did you become interested in becoming beekeepers? Like full time, like, oh, it's not a hobby farm. And... Um, was it that you didn't, you didn't find cows interesting? Was that it? And it sort of drove you in a direction? Uh, sometimes I kind of dream about the simplicity of cows. <laughs> beekeeping can be quite a challenge. Um, but when we had made the decision to transition out of the military, uh, one of the things that I had always secretly wanted to do was, uh, was take on beekeeping and, and do that. And it was really just kind of weird because my wife was working at the time as a finance secretary for our church in a little town called Elgin, Oklahoma. And she went to the post office there to drop off some mail. And there was a sign up sheet for a beekeeping class put on by uh, the Tipton Valley Honey Company in Tipton, Oklahoma. And for some weird reason, she felt compelled to sign me up for that. So call it divine intervention, if you will. But my wife signed me up for a beekeeping class, and I went to it and instantly became hooked. And as the time drew closer and closer and closer for us to move here, it was um, more more focused on bees. But, you know, we wanted to have all this other type of livestock and stuff. But really, as we kind of evolved on our homesteading-like path, was when we realized that uh, bees were just really not so much a uh, livestock that we wanted, but a passion and a lifestyle. Cool. So it's a lifestyle as well. Absolutely. Being a beekeeper is a lifestyle because so many aspects of your life evolve, or I should say revolve around this calendar that all of us beekeepers have about when we should be feeding in the springtime, when we should be doing checks and treatments for mites when we should be doing splits and catching queens and mm. uh, every beekeeper's favorite season, which is swarm season. So your, your life really revolves around that. And uh, we get these cold, long, dark winter months where I'm just kind of scratching at the walls, waiting for an opportunity to get out there and get into some hives. That's cool. That's cool. So when did you, when did you start? When did you start beekeeping? I started beekeeping immediately as soon as we got back here. So we uh, made our exit in April and in May when we had moved back here to Michigan is when I got my first hive and it was an absolute abysmal failure. Oh, and when was, when, what year was that? That was in 2014. So you did your first business venture in beekeeping in 2014 and it was a failure. Why was it a failure? It was a failure because I was a self-educated beekeeper. I went to one class, which was a good general foundation, but it didn't really have the supporting aspects that I would have needed to be a more successful beekeeper. 
Um, and that's not through any fault of the instructor or the class. That's strictly because it's such a wide uh issue on how to keep bees alive and well cared for that you really have to delve into it deeper than just one class when you're self-taught you can sometimes it'll be like drinking from a fire hydrant when Mm. you go on the internet and google something and so a lot of the stuff that i knew wasn't correct or i wasn't learning the correct things Mm. interesting so so it was a failure. So what'd you do after? So you, you dive into this thing, you know, you're pro you're working a job, you're settling after transitioning, right. And you're building a new identity for yourself and how you think about yourself now that you're not a Marine anymore. So what, what'd you do? Well, absolutely. That's the, uh, that is the identity thing. As service members, we all have an identity. We identify as our branch of service, our rank, what we do, uh, that level of importance. And when you transition, you lose a big chunk of that identity. Uh, At the time, I was identified as Nick, the garbage truck mechanic who worked at night on smelly garbage trucks. Um, I'm not going to say that that is a bad profession. It certainly is an honest and an admirable profession. It's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it. But I really felt compelled in my hardest of hearts that where I belonged was in the bees. Mm. As service members, we have a really high uh, level of importance, and we know that. We know that we have a lot of responsibility, be it responsibility to our fellow service members or to a mission. We have a high responsibility and beekeeping to me was that responsibility. So after that failure, there was a lot of remorse about the failure, but there was an even stronger drive than to go ahead and recover from that and uh, really attack the problem head on. So you get some failure. And from whatever source you learned it from, I'm sure it was connected to your military past. You looked at that failure and you're like, nope, I'm going to, I'm going to power my way through this. And all it did was fuel your desire even greater to succeed. Right. Absolutely. Uh, To me, it was, um, it, to me, every single hive is almost like it's it's an extension of myself. It's like a child. I care for it deeply. The bees in there, they're not just insects. It's not just a, a livestock to me. I care deeply about them. So it was a loss, um, not just a loss of a hive, but it was a loss to me. Mm. So from that, I decided to do my best to become the best beekeeper that I could. So I started looking for any and every sort of resource that I could. And eventually I stumbled upon a program that's called heroes to hives. And that's an MSU extension program. And, uh, I went through that program and uh, as a matter of fact, I stuck to the program so well and I really strive to learn everything I could that now I'm actually one of their trainers and I travel around teaching beekeeping for MSU through Heroes to Hives. So Michigan State University, Heroes to Hives, I assume that's military veterans to become beekeepers? Not just their veteran and not just the veterans themselves, but also their dependents. That's cool. Yeah. So um, if you're a dependent of a veteran, uh, we will we will train you through Heroes to Hives also, but it is a 100% free beekeeping training program that's done through online lectures and interactive on the ground uh, hands-on workshops where you'll be able to get your hands inside a beehive and there's a big economic block between people and beekeeping because uh, let's face it beekeeping the equipment and the bees themselves uh, they can be it's an expensive hobby to get into and then you're not guaranteed their survival so it's a risk And uh, through Heroes to Hives, a lot of veterans and people like me who are veteran entrepreneurs want to get started, we can get the training that will mitigate a lot of that risk through that program. I know from uh, past experience that Michigan State University is very connected with the food industry in the state of Michigan. They have their annual food convention, which I attended, and uh, it was 
it was uh, really cool. There was a lot of cool people there doing cool things. So you got to see all their booths and all their cool, uh, you know, new startups in the food industry. And you also got to listen to all the panels and the different things. So that was pretty cool. It's cool. Man, that's such a cool program. It's such a cool program. There's something about, about bees, right? Like there's this almost romanticized attachment with bees and beekeepers. And I haven't met a single person that doesn't, even if they're not interested in like bees, even if they don't like honey, like nobody doesn't like bees. You know, nobody doesn't really think they're not, not cool. Everybody likes bees. Yeah. I think that's the universal acceptance across the board that we all know that here in the U S uh, we have a $450 million annual um, industry that is centered entirely around pollination of crops. Okay. So that's a giant industry. We have based almost our entire agricultural system around using managed colonies of Apis mellifera, the European honeybee as a pollinator. And so a lot of people recognize the fact that without bees, um, we would probably die very soon because of the lack of food that we're not going to get pollinated. It's over one third of all our food is pollinated by bees. Do you pollinate? I do some pollination, but it's on a strict case-by-case basis, and that is because I try to keep my bees away from any and all sort of commercial uh, agriculture that isn't, um, well, I don't want to use the term organic, but uh, using best practices when it comes to sprays and things like that because I take uh, my, my beekeeping very seriously when it comes to that aspect. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Would you feel safer doing pollination on like an organic farm? Yes and no. Um, Yes, because that farm uses better practices. But at the same time, I also have to look and see what type of practices that their neighbor farms are using. Because if I put my bees on a 50 acre organic farm, uh, that's not going to do much for me if the 2000 acres around them are using um, neonicotinoid pesticides or uh, fungicides or any other things that are going to harm my bees because they will travel uh, two and sometimes three miles for pollen and nectar forage. Wow. One little bee. Two One little three. bee. You One, think two about, or three miles. Think about the relative size of a bee to you and then think about yourself walking a mile. And yeah. Think about I'm just going to do a marathon to go get groceries for my family. Several right. times a day. At yeah, that's <laughs> well, wow, that's yeah, that's cool. Is there good money in pollination? Yes, actually, I've been researching this recently. And let's say I decide to take uh, 400 hives on a semi truck because you can fit about 400 hives per semi trailer. If I take 400 hives right now today uh, to California to pollinate almonds, my gross will be $80,000. That's that's just my gross what, before my expenses what, are taken out. But yeah, you you can expect about two hundred dollars per hive. Uh, that's the high. So if you have a very strong, robust hive, you can charge up to two hundred dollars to pollinate almonds. Per wow! Hive. Wow! Now, of course, there are various fees and brokers that need to be taken care of in that chain, but it's easy to see how beekeepers can cover their running expenses for an entire year off of one trip to the California almond orchards. There's some risk with that, isn't there, though? Because, you know, I think like boot camp and you get all these dudes from all over the country and then you sit them all in one room together and everybody gets sick. Right. Because you're all touching the same things. You're all smelling the same things and everybody's gross. And so everybody gets super sick with like five different like little flu or cold type diseases at the same time. So everything sucks. Um, When you get bees from all over the country and you put them in the back of a truck, and you drive 200 miles with them. Is that dangerous? For your bees? You are absolutely 100% right with that assessment because when you make a trip like that, you're expected to lose 10% of your stock. So that would be 10 hives out of every 100 would not survive the trip. And in addition to that, disease spread 
can be rampant and can be a real issue. So you need to be on the ball if you're a beekeeper that's pollinating and know immediately how to identify different diseases and different ailments that are going to be coming into your hives if they come into contact with the hive. Because, well, I may be using best safe practices with my bees. Someone else may not. And mm. uh, that's going to become an issue when we get into close proximity. Yeah. Don't want your bees touching them gross bees. No, certainly not. That's, it's bad for beesness. I'm going to stay away from bee puns as much as I want to. So if you are interested in becoming a beekeeper, pollination, potentially a lot of good money, a lot of risk though, should know what you're doing before you start doing it. So what's your primary product with beekeeping? You got some product here on the table. What do we got here? Uh, what we have here is I've got some honey and some lotions that we make. That's cool. Uh, can I see this? You would, yeah, knock yourself out. Oh, okay. Normally, you know, you would assume, okay, honey comes from honeybees. What other products could you have? Well, there's tons of different products that come from the apiary. And the primary is going to be bees and beeswax, but there's also propolis, which is a uh, antibiotic and antiseptic um, substance yeah it's a hard substance that's created by bees they use it to fill gaps and it's made from different tree resins and stuff like that and uh, that's used in a different uh, array of chemical or it's like uh, cosmetics and medicines and things oh, like that smells good lavender yeah but uh, we also take our beeswax and uh, we mix it with shea butter and coconut oil that's and cool. lots of other stuff we make um lotions lip balms all sorts of things and really when we go to market one of our biggest things we try to do is get all those products out there and let people know hey aside from the honey and aside from the pollination you really do get a lot of products from bees and the new products that we're rolling out with that aren't necessarily new to the market but are new to a lot of consumers are beeswax wraps um it's a it's a method of phasing out some of your plastic use and it's essentially a cloth impregnated with beeswax and um, pine resin and a few other things that replaces saran wrap or plastic wrap and quite frankly i find it much easier to use in that stuff it sounds like it smells good it actually does smell quite pleasant i'm sure it does and isn't this uh like Honey is full of antioxidants, right? So you think like processed sugar to use as a sweetener. Um, we don't even we don't even keep processed sugar in our well, we don't keep any sugar in our kitchen at home. But like honey, we have some honey on the shelf, right? So like things that I've heard about honey is that it's full of antioxidants and it's a way healthier sweetener alternative. And it's cool because you know it's cool to like buy honey that's locally sourced too, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, on average, the U.S. consumes about 480 million pounds of honey every single year. So that's about one pound or 12 fluid ounces for every man, woman, and child in the U.S. And based off of those numbers, you would think that uh, we're pumping out a lot of honey in the U.S., but that's not true. As a matter of fact, over 60% or around 60% of our honey is imported from other countries. And a lot of times those countries, they might be adulterating their honey or they might be using antibiotics yeah. that they shouldn't. So it's a little bit of buyer beware there. You definitely want to check out. Buyer the, beware. Yes, buyer be aware. Check out your label. So see where your honey is made. You know, you go to the store and you look at the honeys. If it doesn't say, you know, something like Great Lakes honey or something, you want to read the label anyway and, and look at it. And see where your honey was made, because more often than not, it'll be a product from another country. And when you China, yeah, I'm not gonna name and names some of that here. high fructose China syrup in your. Well, actually, the they know how to test for a high fructose corn syrup adulteration. They're the Chinese and some of those other Asian countries. They're using rice flour syrup. They're using a rice syrup because they haven't found a way to test for that. And they're adulterating their honey with that. And they're also have been accused and, you know, convicted a few times of illegal dumping, selling their honey at a loss to hurt U.S. beekeepers. So what? buyer, buyer, China? beware, <sighs> check your labels, buy your honey, know your beekeeper, because the honey that I sell is 100% unheated, 
unfiltered. It is raw honey. It has all the pollen and the enzymes in it as the bees intended. And it really is a big benefit to you over using refined sugar, um, mainly because not only are you getting the health benefits of eating raw honey, but the way that your taste buds perceive honey is they think that it's sweeter than your regular sugar is. So you'll actually use less honey, say, in your coffee or tea to sweeten it. If you like to put sugar in your honey or in your coffee or your tea, you'll use less honey than you would regular granulated sugar. So it helps cool. you kind of cut back on that sugar intake. So I'm back to back to the timeline, right? So I'm making the business. Mm-hmm. Um, so you start again. Do you find more success in this second second attempt at it? Yeah, I um so my first hive was a failure. After that, I really doubled down and I got three hives and I received, you know, marginally better results. I attended Heroes to Hives and really became a rock star. And that's when I decided that I was going to start cutting hives out of people's walls because at this point in time I had gotten a lot more education on how to keep bees, but I was kind of out of capital. I couldn't spend any more money to buy bees and I really needed to up my numbers. So I thought, what better way than to make use of my current construction knowledge, start cutting apart people's walls and removing bees from them and well, charging them money for my services at the same time. You mean literally cutting bees from people's walls? Absolutely. Bees are a fantastic judge of uh, crappy construction (laughs) and if they find a way to get in your wall and they like what they find in there in the springtime when bees do what we call swarming or they'll split in two like cells in your body would that's how they reproduce themselves and make more beehives they'll split in two a queen will lay a egg for a new queen in the old hive and she will take half the bees and go find a new cavity to reside in and sometimes that's people's walls so in that event they need to hire somebody like me who knows what they're doing and i will come in and remove them from the wall and do it in a manner that the bees won't come back and that the mess is all cleaned up because if the beehive dies inside your wall it's not going to be pretty. Uh, I bet it smells wonderful. Oh, it's a, it's a it's a horrible mess with all the pests that are associated. So oh, yeah. anyway, after I started removing hives from people's walls was when I started realizing that the wild hives that I was catching out of people's walls were tough. It was kind of like the junkyard dog of bees. I mean, these things were tough. You couldn't, <laughs> they were surviving on their own in people's walls without any human hand. And as most beekeepers will identify with me, it's tough to keep bees alive, especially in Michigan. And so I started to breed my own bees out of these bees that I was capturing out of people's walls and plus my numbers up with them and started to produce some really strong bees. You have all these like junkyard bees and they're all rough. And how do you, how do you get something more tame that you can work with out of, out of that? Well, really, what it boils down to is just like any other breeding program. You look for the traits that you want the best out of your bees, and those are the bees that you breed from. You might not have the best stock in your apiary or your bee yard, but you can make superior stock from less than superior genetics under superior conditions. What what a cool thing. Dude, that's such a hustle. Yeah, exactly. I love these stories of guys that are like, oh, yeah, I wanted to do it. So I went in all in. And because I was stupid and I didn't know what I was doing, I lost all my money. So then I had to figure out a way to make it work with no money. And then it was successful. Right. I, I love that. Absolutely. I'd have to say bootstrapping is the best thing that ever happened to me because it really teaches you where you need to cut the fat out of your organization. Mm. and how to be resourceful. Uh, Because with that being said, you know, you've got to learn now, you got to make do with what you got. I've got these wild hives that I cut out of people's walls and have hauled back here to my farm and I start a breeding program and I take the best ones out of them and I breed new queens out of those bees and give them the best nutrition possible to make the strongest queens and the strongest hives possible. And that's how I started plussing up my numbers. The failure and all that 
burns you down, but the whole experience bootstrapping and realizing how much more you had to learn. And then you got hungry for that knowledge and you went back into it and you emerged from this whole trial so much better from it. Right. And a new understanding of how, what level of knowledge and skill, what kind of beekeeper you wanted to have. You had a a new perspective for it. And like you said, even from that failure, you're happy that it happened because it was the best thing that ever happened to you. Right. And I think that's something that can be applicable to anybody that's pursuing any path that they're on. Like you can experience a tremendous failure, like literally all your, your entire stock dies. And from that, depending on how you react to that, depending on how you feel about that and process that information uh, that drives your heart and your mind into the path that's going to can either lead to failure a uh, residual failure where you continue to not try anything anymore because you're afraid of failing again or makes you want to be stronger and lean into the next challenge ahead and then you can find success on the other side of that and that's a story that you hear all the time from all sorts of people in whatever industry in business out of business all the time anybody that accomplishes anything great it's a similar story well, in, uh, let's see, not too long ago, I was in cohort two of uh, Michigan Veteran Entrepreneur Lab put on by GVSU. Yeah, I was in cohort one. That was a really cool experience. Yeah, it was fantastic. I learned a lot about how to streamline my business and really how to take it from concept to someday to, you know what, sink or swim, we're going after this. Mm-hmm. And I I won from that competition, and with the capital, we purchased a lot more bees for my farm. And with that, we were able to start uh, just a crap load of new hives and really get us ready for 2020 to come out of the gate swinging. But in addition to that, we also got about, um, I think it was 864 pounds of honey. So what? Yeah. How, yeah. how how much of room does 864 pounds of honey take well just to give you an idea um, each five gallon bucket weighs 60 pounds oh so so a lot of honey a lot (laughs) of honey so what we've been doing uh in the winter time while we are getting ready to really tackle 2020 is we have been going to markets and trying to sell our honey I think it's really funny because when I was reshaping my business during MVE and deciding, you know, what areas were most profitable, we really focused heavily on queen production and nucleus colony production, which is a nucleus colony is a small hive that you sell. Oh, so like a bee starter kit. Essentially, yes. That's how you start a hive is you purchase a nucleus colony. Uh, we really focused heavy on those aspects, but in current times, you know, we don't have a lot to do with that, but we have all this honey and we also, you know, kind of shied away from farmer's markets. Not to say that we don't do well at farmer's markets. We certainly do, but we never really did well enough that we felt that it was a really profitable experience for us. Yeah. So lately we've been crashing unconventional markets for honey. We've been going to craft shows, gun shows, anywhere we can get. Oh, that's cool. And you would be amazed at uh, the sales that we have. In addition to that, we've been working really hard expanding our product line besides just honey and beeswax. My wife has been a key factor in that. Um, It's really great having your wife be your best friend and your business partner. I'm going to say that it does cause some issues as uh, yeah. Yeah. Everybody can probably imagine (laughs) not, not for everybody. I'm, I'm in the same boat. My wife is also a business partner and, and my best friend. Uh, So not for everybody, but if you can pull it off, if you can pull it off, there are a few things that are as rewarding. Yeah. If you can catch that chip and Joanne Gaines type energy. You, yeah, and you learn just how to make it work. But uh, I'm really proud of her because she has worked super hard mm. expanding our product line with beeswax wraps, lotions, lip balms, uh, you name it. She's working to expand our line to all things bee related, and to really get us out there besides just wax and honey. Anything else? 
Um, I'm just, uh, I'm really happy looking forward to the future. I would have to say that my journey as a entrepreneur and business owner, it certainly is fraught with, you know, lots of uncertainties and, and stress and things like that. But to be the author of your own destiny uh, is not something that everybody gets to have the advantage of saying. And to me, it's one of the most important aspects of my identity as who I am and not just a beekeeper. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. There's two things that we try and do with the show is we try and capture the human aspect of this journey because there's a lot of things about starting your own business is you have to choose risk. And a lot of people, you know, there's, there's two kinds of ways to venture into business. You can have, you can pursue an occupation, right? You can pursue an identity. People start a beekeeping farm because they're super interested in beekeeping. Some people start a bakery because they want to be bakers. I'm, I have an interview with a, a baker on Thursday that I'm looking forward to. And, um, some people, you know, like me, don't know what they want to do. They just know that they uh, want to do their own thing, right? And so they're on the path of figuring it out. But regardless, uh, whatever the reasons, when you go out and you're starting your own businesses, your own organizations, they're a reflection of you, right? They're they're a reflection of you, and this, and there's risk associated with that. And you have to go out there and put yourself in front of the world. All those things, man. That's all there's a tremendous amount of human emotion that is associated with that. So one of the, the the first thing that we try and do is capture that, capture those stories and what it's like to go through all that. And then the other thing that we try and do is provide tangible information for anybody that's interested in that specific field. Right. Sounds like that's something you love to do. You love to mentor, right. You love to teach and instruct. Right. It's pretty evident with your, what you have going over, was that uh, at MSU? What was the name of that organization? Uh, Heroes to Hives is the name of the extension that I teach for. Cool. Heroes to Hives. So right here, if for anybody that's interested in beekeeping or maybe has started, what are some, what are some things that you would say to, if you had a friend that wanted to start a beekeeping farm, what would you, what would you tell them? Well, first off, if you are a veteran or a uh, dependent of a veteran, you need to go and just type in heroes to hives.com and it won't direct you to that website per se, but it'll take you to the MSU website where you can sign up and take your classes. Now, if you're not a veteran and you are per se in the West Michigan, greater Grand Rapids area, then you can go on to my website, www.hickorytreefarmapiaries.com and I offer beekeeping classes, or you need to look for your local uh, beekeeping club and find a mentor because we are in a very serious position with the decline in honeybee numbers. We need more beekeepers. We need more bees. But what we need is we need beekeepers that are going to uh, take care of the bees properly, manage pest problems, and, and keep them alive. So with that being said, find yourself uh, the proper mentorship before you start beekeeping. There's a lot of great resources out there on the internet to go ahead and learn independently on your own, but nothing is going to beat that mentorship. Well, so I can't just like hop on YouTube for a few hours and be ready to rock and roll as a beekeeper. I would highly recommend against that. Oh, okay. Good to know. Are you guys selling online or is it strictly farmer's market? Like, can I go onto a website and, or is there a way that I can order some? If I want to get some of your product, what are the different ways that I can do that? If you are local to us, we post up quite frequently what markets we will be attending. If you want to meet up with us in person, you can also order off of our website. We have a secure online store. And with that store, you can choose to purchase and pick up locally or have it shipped to you. We ship USPS and UPS and you can order that anytime 24 7 and we'll fulfill that order and get it out to you as quick as possible cool cool 
And uh, what's your website? People want to learn more about you. Yeah, that website again is www.hickorytreefarmapiaries.com. And on that website, you will find all the information you need to know about us, our events. And uh, coming up pretty soon, you can check out our blog postings. We'll have all sorts of good resources for beekeepers on there from tips, tricks to links to videos that we find important and anything that can help you out. That's that's awesome. Well, thank you so much, for Nick, for allowing me to come over. All right, guys. Thank you for watching. Um, if you're interested and you want to support what we're doing uh, in this project, to be able, interviewing entrepreneurs and getting their stories, you can check out hwperformance.com. We started with sunglasses. We had our own line of sunglasses. Now we have our own line of supplements. We've got protein powder, pre-workout, that sort of stuff. And that line is always expanding. So uh, if you're interested, you can support. We also have some swag on there, uh, some Bo stickers. If you know who Bo is, Bo the Bulldog. It's my bulldog. He's the mascot of the business, and he likes to show up for things. We plan on doing more stuff with that, so it's kind of exciting. Um, also, like if you want to support, you can subscribe, like, share. Please share this. If you know anybody that's interested in beekeeping, especially a military veteran that's interested in, that's going to be getting out soon or have recently separated, you know, uh, maybe share this with them. There's a lot of good, hard lessons learned that they can learn the easy way. Uh, yeah. Check us out. And uh, thank you so much for listening in and for you on YouTube for watching. Take care. Oh, nice. Yeah? All right, now, why don't you come on up here and get up close and personal. So we're just taking a sheet of newspaper. That's gonna hold our sugar. So we're gonna get some sugar here. And right there is our cluster of bees. You can see that moisture dripping right off. That's what we're wanting to save them from. So there they are, they're overwintering. We're just gonna put this down on top of them and they're fine, this won't hurt them a bit. But this sugar is gonna give them a good source of emergency food and it'll help protect them from that moisture buildup. So we'll put all of that on there. That's quite a bit of sugar. Yeah, but they eat quite a bit. It requires a lot of nutrition in order to stay warm and uh, sustain the colony because they rely entirely on friction of their body plates to generate the heat that they need in order to stay alive during the winter time because honeybees contrary to popular belief do not hibernate they stay active all winter long so after we toss the sugar on there we just put the lid back on and we'll check on them later on How's that for you?